So we are now live. This is the uh, Dev Book Club. We are covering Clean Code by Robert Martin. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Chapter 1, which is Clean Code, kind of the introduction, you know, why does this book exist kind of thing. Um, I am joined by several of the people tonight, uh, people who I think, well, a couple of you were on the last, uh, last book we did implementing domain-driven design, but a few new faces, which is awesome. Um, so I'm going to go through and just... Uh, introduce yourself, uh, let everyone know, you know, why you're doing this, I guess, who you are, that kind of thing. So uh, we'll start on the right, we'll start with Martin. Yeah, I'm uh, Martin from uh, Denmark. I've been stalking a lot of the talks and hanging out for a while. And now I thought it was the time to, to join. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Well, welcome, Martin. And then we've got uh, Joe. Hey, how's it going? I am Joe. I'm from Memphis. I run uh, Memphis PHP. Okay, cool. And then um, we have, is it Gemma? I should have asked you this beforehand. Is it Gemma? <laughs> yes, it's Gemma, soft All right. G. All right, good. Gemma. Hi, I'm Gemma. I, I work for Wonder Proxy. So I'm in New Mexico, U.S. All right, and then uh, Chris. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm in uh, Northwest Ohio, and I bum around on the internet all day. <laughs> That's what we all do. I Don't think. we all, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Adam. Hi, I'm Adam Kolb. I'm in uh, South Florida. Uh, work at Zend and uh, getting ready to enjoy this book again. I've read it before a couple times, but uh, looking forward to enjoy it with the group and maybe pick up some more things on about it. That's awesome, and Adam is also getting ready to start the Sunshine PHP conference down in Miami. So, well, I guess it's probably too late to book your tickets and everything now, but yeah, we've been sold out for, for two weeks. <laughs> plug for next year. And then we also have uh, Nathaniel has joined us. Nathaniel, Hi. In a brief introduction, so take it away. Hi, I'm Nathaniel. I'm a front end uh, guy in Memphis, Tennessee, and I can't figure out how to turn on this title thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, the toolbox on the left. Yeah, it's toolbox on the left. I'll figure it out. I'm sure. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, so we were talking about chapter one tonight. I know Joe. I actually took a cue from you, and you posted some notes in a GitHub repository earlier. So I pulled up on my own thing. I thought that was a good idea to keep track. But uh, So that will be available. I know Joe's, I, I tweeted it out from our account, so you can go check that out if you want to. Um, chapter one, I believe, was mostly, I guess we can call it the introduction. So let's start this off. Who, who has something they observed or something they found interesting out of this chapter? I'll go. I'll go. Um, I I love the point he makes near the end of the chapter. Um, <laughs> making your code easy to read makes it easier to write. I love that point. I love it because that that is the justification for having like coding standards and style standards and and do we use underscores that or camel case or whatever. I I love that point. It. It makes all of the aesthetic changes that you that you make to your code worthwhile to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I I totally agree with you on that. I think it's yeah, and I I don't think there's a better way to actually close out the chapter than that. So I definitely agree with you on that point. So let me just start at the end. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. That's fine. We can go backwards if you want to. <laughs> um. Okay. So, uh, Joe, I noticed that you had a few uh, great things. So what? What do you have for us? Uh, so some of the stuff that really stood out to me was the uh, the quotes where uh, he, where uh, the author is talking about interviewing all these different people, and he's not interviewing anybody. You know, all these people are you know very you know they're experts in their own in their own right, and a lot of them kind of say different things. And I think what really stood out for me was some of them may, the the impact and some of the phrasing that a, that a lot of them used, uh, such as um, Oh, where is it? Uh, code sense, uh, the ability to recognize code, uh, code being elegant and efficient, uh, pleasing. Uh, not not always the first thing you would think about when you're talking about code, but you know when you look at clean code, that is some some great descriptive descriptive uh, phrasing about what what clean code is. 
Yeah, I think I picked up on that on that section too, and um, it, it was kind of nostalgic a little bit for me. Uh, Bjarni Straustrup, the inventor of C++, actually took a, a course from him in college on, on C++, and I, I kind of laughed when he was talking about how code is elegant and efficient, which I think you just, you just mentioned. He was talking about the the idea that you know if you if you can make your code essentially clean enough or or elegant, readable enough that it will it will not tempt people to come in and make a mess of it. And then that was of course a nod out to the pragmatic programmers broken windows um, theory, which if you haven't read that book, you should definitely read. I think that's required reading for everybody. So. Not just not just you guys, but everybody. So <laughs> I think you should pick it up. But yeah, I, I caught onto that too, and I I think the the idea of the code sense is also a very powerful one. It's you know I think I wrote down something along the lines of you it's something that you need to develop. That it's not something that everyone is um, I guess blessed with. Um, so it is something that is a very powerful tool as you're as you're looking at code. So, yeah. yeah, the other thing that I really picked up on or that I really relate to was uh, LeBlanc's law of uh, later equals never when I'll fix this code later. And as somebody who deals with a, 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 a legacy code base that is showing signs of age after, uh, you know, largely just run, sit, sitting there running for a number of years, that really relates to me because I, I'll go through some of our older code and it's very obvious that it was like, oh, well, this was something that you know could have been fixed right then, but it was not deemed important enough, and it was just going to be fixed later, and later never happened. Yep. I think there's a little bit of a balancing act there, yes. because too often you're kind of stuck in a rut, and you almost need to go on to some other part and then come back to it, and then you have this like breakthrough that gets you the better code. So there's almost a a balancing point where sometimes you just have to let it sit, and sometimes you um, you just got to remember to get back to it. Almost like that day, I think the if you yeah. wait a day, you'll never get back to it. Yeah, it's like trying to balance the uh, the business needs if it's a business application, or a, lo a lot of times when I'm talking to people who are you know startup developers in a startup culture, it's very much you know we we don't have time to to do this now because we have to push this feature, we have to ship this code. And it's always this balancing act of how much can you, you know, how much can you put off realistically and still not be underwater in technical debt. That's definitely true. I think part of part of LeBlanc's law, I think to me anyway, means that, you know, if if you're actively saying, if you find yourself actively saying a whole bunch, like you're saying, oh, I know this is, I know this is problematic. Like you've got the sense about you to know that what you're doing is is a problem. And you keep repeatedly doing that, like you keep pushing things down. I think that's where the problem comes mm -hmm. up. But I definitely agree with you, Nathaniel, that you know there's plenty of times where you know I've figured out a much better solution while you know taking a shower or driving a car or something, and I'm just like, oh, that was so. So you know, leaving leaving some things that you're not exactly sold on as being the best solution, I think, is okay occasionally, but don't make it a Constant. I'm gonna do this later. I'm gonna do this later. I'm because mm -hmm. you will. Well, I I've been places where later is gonna come in 2020. I think so. <laughs> it's just just I, one. Of those I know things. that feeling. <laughs> Which well, of course I, doesn't. Yeah. Go ahead. I I think an alternative there because like in startup culture where you 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 know you're going MVP. You gotta get it out the door. Gotta get it out the door. Um, I think that can that can be fine if you acknowledge technical debt as something that you really have to deal with on a regular basis. So say you do like MVP three days a week and then the rest of the week you do technical debt catch up or something like that. So you can still get those features out the door. You're not like mired down in sort of design paralysis. Um, but you can then go back and fix all of the all of the ugly code that you created while you were while you were doing that. I don't know. Well, I haven't, I haven't been in a place where that's really like good. a thing. So. <laughs> There, there's a really good line in there. It says, clean code is code that's been taken care of. So I think as long as we keep mindful of the fact that if we're writing bad code today and we commit to going back and fixing it you know, as quickly as possible, I think that that is probably the, the biggest thing. You know, We're taking care of that code over time, not letting it languish. And if we have technical debt, we're paying off that technical debt as quickly as we can. Yeah. <clears throat> I also found it really... Um, I guess inspiring that the person who mentioned the thing about you know code that is clean is is appreciable or is something that you can tell that who the person who wrote it 
um, cares. You know, they're they're showing care when they're developing this code. Was Michael Feathers the author of Working Effectively with Legacy Code? It's like you know that he's seen a bunch of code that nobody cared about. And someone just pushed out and said, "We're done." So I thought it was it was very fitting that he was the person who brought that into the into the conversation. All right, Martin, uh, what is one thing you picked up out of this chapter? Actually, the, the first mark I put in the book was uh, in the foreword, um, the, the five S's. Um, I don't think I've heard about them before, but I, I really think they, they make perfect sense in, uh, in software de development. Um, the, uh, organization, uh, sorting, know where, where every, everything are, uh, systematize, uh, shine, stand, standardization, or uh, self-discipline. <coughs> I think it, it it just makes sense uh, that you... It sounds like a recap of the whole, whole book, I think. Yeah, I think... <laughs> Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I, I, yeah, I, I think that you know, organization, is especially like that's one that really jumps out to me because it's you know, I, I like to organize things. Like you may not be able to see, but I've got like tons of bins and everything that they're actually labeled, and my wife makes fun of me about this. But you know, I, <laughs> your elephants are in rainbow order. Yes, they are. Well, they are right now until my son comes in here and it takes them off. But right now they're they're set. But um, I, I found that you know a lot of times it makes it makes it very difficult to work in a code base where you can you don't know where things are going to be. And I think this is one of the the powerful things that you know, or or one of the lures that people are drawn to frameworks that are opinionated about this kind of thing. But beyond that, I think. You know, if you can tell organization from a structural standpoint plus organization within code, like you can tell that someone has gone through and, and done the work to make things make sense and like separate concerns and separate things into you know small cohesive units. Like I think this this is what makes me happiest when I get into a code base and I'm like, oh, this makes sense because I know I can follow this without having to sit here and trace things with a debugger or you know print print statements, which I do sometimes, but, you know, I don't have to trace to figure out where I'm going. I can just intuitively get there. And I think that's a cool, or that, that's something that I take away from those those five facets. Yeah, it, it's a little like uh, the, the quote from uh, Walt Cunningham um, about uh, uh, um, uh, turns out to be pretty much what you expected. Um, so also about this, the structure of the project. So you, it, it just makes sense where everything is placed. There you go. That that's a very succinct way to sum up what I just said in like two minutes. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't me. It was Mark Cunningham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Nathaniel. What do you what do you have for us? So I was just kind of dovetailing off that point, it seems like that is a whole lot of work. And I like to code, you know? So it's, it's, I almost find, like, within myself, that type of work of, like, where to lay out everything almost, like, gets in the way, and I sort of forget where I am, and then I'm, like, moving stuff around all over the place. And I think, like, that's why frameworks are so attractive to me, because someone has already done, like, a lot of that hard work, and I know where it is. I can just Google, like, I don't know where this thing is, and they're like, oh, it's probably in this, like, include path. So, like, developing your own stuff, um, especially me because I'm relatively inexperienced, it's just that's where a lot of the hard work is. And, you know, I come back to stuff I wrote a month ago, and I'm like, eh, I broke that file up into two weird different places, and maybe it should have broken up into thir three, and now I'm like... So I'm almost fighting against myself because it, I don't have that organization often from the stuff I'm working on, so... But I think part of that is... You know, you're as as you come back to code that you wrote a couple of months ago, and you mm -hmm. say this doesn't make sense to me. That's because you've grown. You're, you're starting to improve your code sense and mm -hmm. understand that, hey, this this wasn't the best decision. And I think that that to me is is more useful to teach someone than just telling them, no, don't put it there. Put it in, you know, apps models or whatever. Like I think it's it's more useful to teach or to let someone organically figure out that there's problems in their code base. And I think that's a 
definitely, in my opinion, it's it's a good sign that you are looking at something from two months ago, and it's not like, oh, this makes perfect sense. Like I, this was the best decision I've ever made to put it here. Granted, you're going to do that occasionally, but for the most part, especially as I was, as I was starting out, um, and even getting off the, you know, I'm developing in someone else's required structure, mm-hmm. and starting my own or trying to blaze my own path kind of thing, which, whatever, we won't get there. But uh, I, I started finding little bitty problems with with my approach on, you know, from the day before. Like, I, it wasn't even, you know, two months. It was like I would come in the next day and just have had this enlightenment that says, oh, this is obviously not part of this particular module or this obviously is not a in the controller tier or whatever you want to call it. Like, however you're, however you're saying, this isn't an application concern. This is something else. And that's where I started to get into things like domain-driven design and really understand, you know, how should I structure things? Like, that, I think, is, is a powerful concept once you break free of, I have to put this here because MVC and the directory is named controllers and this is sort of in there. I think once you break free of that, you're, you're free to, you know, you're going to grow a lot more as a developer. Yeah. But don't rush it. Yeah, that makes sense. Oftentimes, what I find is with, uh, you know, I mean, we all come back and view code, you know, our future selves, you know, view the code, and we, we ask, why the hell did we do that? Um, I, I think part of that is not so much attributed to we've learned so much, because like you said, it could be the next day, it could be the next week, it could be six months from now. I think a large percentage of that uh, goes back to requirements, right? Uh, maybe we maybe we slept on it and we understand the requirements a little bit better and it's more ingrained in our mind. So when we look at the code, oftentimes we can make the code make more sense because now we understand the requirements a little bit better. Six months from now on the same project, I'm obviously going to understand the requirements better than I do today. Um, you know, so so the code is obviously going to have to change be, because of that. Uh, that has nothing to do with the book. That was, there was nothing in there about that. It's just a, it's just a little segue. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I I would disagree a little bit. I think that it, it does have a lot to do with the book. I I wrote down something as, um, you know, code is representative of the details of the requirements. So you know, what code you've written is kind of the the requirements that you had and the specification boiled down into something that a computer, that a dumb machine can execute. Right. So I think I think what, what your point is definitely that, you know, as you gain a better understanding yourself of the requirements, the code is going to change because it's a representation of the requirements and your understanding of the requirements. So yeah. as you as you develop that side of things, you're going to naturally have to modify or improve your you know code that you wrote for the the machine that's just going to do whatever you want to you know to to execute so yeah i forgot that paragraph see i, I i'm learning more about the requirements as we go <laughs> there you go all right, well, since you already have the microphone, what, what is something that you picked out? Uh, so, so there's a couple other things that really grabbed my attention. Um, you know, being a martial artist myself, and it's something that I talk about when I'm speaking at conferences, you know, we, we martial arts, of course, is a lifelong study. It's something that we adapt with over time. It's not something you learn overnight. And coding is much the same thing. Um, you know, that was something that, that he had mentioned uh, in his own section. Uh, you know, talking about how uh, everybody has a different interpretation of what good is, you know, or, or what uh, best practice is. You know, there's, uh, there's always that. And, and one of the other things, um, I'm sorry, I guess I could pause if somebody else wants to comment on that. Um, going once, going twice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, the other thing that grabbed my attention was something else that I say quite often, but uh, and, and this is actually where I got it from uh, when I first read this book, and that is that we're authors. Um, developers spend more time reading code than they do writing code. Uh, so, so when somebody's following behind you, you are the author, and other people are reading the code or reading the book. Um, you know that you wrote, and and because of that, it's important to make sure that it is more readable for others, and that goes into, you know, coding standards, styles, and things like that, uh, as well as good coding practice to make sure it's more readable, and uh, so those are just really things that resonate with me a great deal. Um, you know, we're authors, and we have to make sure that we we help not just our future self, but other future other people. 
So I guess I my, think... my... Oh, oh sorry, go ahead. No, I was oh. just going to make a joke comment, but... Uh... So I guess my question to you, Adam, is do you write? Do you tend to write more novels or more short stories? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, 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 I program very iteratively, as do most people, but, uh, but I... So you write serials. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so nice. um, I, I, tend not to, I tend to write very dirty code initially. Um, you know, I just, I just get the crap out there. And then uh, once, the, once the business requirements are met in a raw sense, um, then I go back through step-by-step uh, -step refactoring and refactor it to be nice and pretty. Um, you know, and generally, I, at first I write a novel and then I whittle it down to a news article, right? Um, you know, so that's pretty much the, the way that I code. Uh, I, I start with a whole bunch of code and then, and then end up with something nice and clean and pretty. That is a good answer. Jimmy, you had something to, to say? Oh, I was going to say, um, I think it's ironic that I mean, we're all we're all developers. We're all sitting here saying, yes, it's very important to write readable code, and everybody needs to be able to read my code. And the things that we value, like the things that we compete on, are how few characters can you write your code in? <laughs> let's let code go. Like how I can I remember I was a kid. I was writing like my first C program ever, and I, I did it in like three different executables with like files transferring things in. But it was it was a complete mess. And I can remember my father took what I had done. And reduced it to like six lines of Perl. <laughs> Wait, I mean, of course he did, right? So, and that was like, wow, that's amazing. He can write it in such a small, so succinctly. Wow, wow. So like, where? I I just think it's it's funny that that's what we value. That's what we compete on. That's what we're like. Wow, that's a really cool way of doing it. So short. And we should be like, wow, that's so readable. Thank you for making it understandable. <laughs> I think I think the difference is context, right? Like I think if you yeah, yeah. you know you, you want readable code when it's something you're having to maintain, but when it's something you're trying to show off how clever you are, who cares yeah. if anyone can read it? Look at this, look what I made, right? Look what it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> Top coder all the way, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's an, that's another interesting point that I think was in this chapter. I read a couple ahead, was don't try to be clever. Because that I mean there isn't a value to that really in a professional business sense. Uh, unless it's really well commented, and, and then and then why not just write something that's a little bit more readable? I mean, it, in terms of you have to go back and change this later, and you have to do it probably as quickly as possible, um, because that's what your company is based on. You get paid for time, and your company gets time. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we re really need to rethink what we do, kind of showing off then. Well, that goes to another thing that I say quite often, and that is uh, our job as developers is to make ourselves replaceable. And if you're writing really fancy code and if you're writing the, the little snowflake, right, uh, the unicorn of code, then you're not making yourself replaceable because you're making it harder for the company to find somebody to follow behind you. And, and to me, that is a, that's a cardinal sin. Um, to me, that's job know. security, man. What's what's the what's the saying is that you should program all of your code like the person who who is going to maintain it behind you knows where you live. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's a Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chris, we are around to you. What do you got? So I, I think the thing that stuck out to me the most, and I don't do Laravel, but I do like the idea that. Um, Programmers are artists, and our job is to make elegant, focused code. Um, and he, he goes over this quite a bit throughout this first chapter. Um, but thing, you know, like we, we take a blank screen through a series of transformations until it's an elegantly coded system, and clean code is focused. And it should be matter of fact as opposed to speculative. Um, and like I said earlier, like clean code is code that's been taken care of. I, I think. For me, I really like the idea that we are crafting something, not just building something, because this is something we want to stay around either um, for projects that we, we want to have longevity or, you know, like if we do have to have other people maintain this when we leave the company or whatever. We want people to be able to use our code and enjoy the code instead of, you know, a new hire coming on and saying, like, what the hell did you do? I can't understand any of this. <laughs> Um, so th I think that's the kind of stuff that stuck out to me the most, um, and especially being in PHP. Uh, I, I don't know if, if Martin said this from someone else because 
uh, Kindle doesn't <laughs> so let me annotate things that nicely. Uh, beautiful code makes language look like it was made for the problem, which yes. when we I can do that. nice things in PHP, I think that's always a plus. You know, it, it doesn't really matter what language we're in, but you know, when we can write good code, you know, it looks like it was meant to be there. Yeah. And yeah, PHP I, can I, be made beautiful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Despite some some uh, comments I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> no arguments here. I don't think anyone's going to take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, kind of, you know, on that on that same line. Like what I what I really liked about this chapter was when he was talking about, you know, as you're as you're working on code or as you're looking at code, think about the, you know, he called it the total cost of ownership of of the code, like. A messy code base is something that's going to cause you to uh, wade through it. I think he said, you know, wade through, wade through bad code. And I, I put the quote, you know, slog through, you know, a bunch of tangled brambles and hidden pitfalls and things that, you know, you could never estimate around, and you know, all these problems. And then, you know, how does that, how does that balance out? Like you end up making excuses and saying, oh well, we had really tight deadlines. We've got this huge mess of a code base. And then your requirements were all changing, so we made even more of a mess. And he basically said, "No, you know, don't make these excuses. That's that's not how professionals act. Like that's being very unprofessional, um, creating and leaving messes. So take a little pride in what you're doing, and you know, clean up the mess because it is something that you're not ever going to get out from under in the future." And something else he said in, uh, along that same line was when he was talking about, uh, you know, I, I love his example of, uh, of, of being professional and writing good code. And your managers want good code even if they don't realize that they do, right? Uh, because they want the side effects of the good code. They want, they want faster features, you know, or faster completion of features and, and, and so forth. And, and, you know, and then he uses the, he uses the example of the doctor um, you know, where a patient's not going to tell a doctor, oh, no, 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 don't wash your hands. I need you to work on me fast, right? Um, you know, so, so I, I, I love that. Uh, I love that story about that, and, and I've used it myself. So I, I've stolen a lot out of this book. <laughs> <laughs> I recently heard yeah, somebody right. make the same, the, same, uh, the same argument about writing tests and how that you shouldn't have to sell tests to your client. It's part of your job. You should just do it. It's just like the uh, the surgeon washing their hands. Well, he said that in uh, No Capes. Oh, that's where it was from. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Same author, but different different thing. <laughs> or perhaps we should be more like you know repairmen, like uh, auto mechanics and stuff, who they just they charge you a shop fee. You know, regardless, <laughs> they're like, oh yeah, by the way, it was you know there's a fifty dollar or you know ten percent or whatever shop fee for. You know, I had to use some rags and stuff. So, <laughs> cleaning up our code should obviously be a shop fee of some sort. So, I'm going to put this into my next business model. I think this is a good idea. One of the other things that kind of stuck out for me was uh, where he's talking about, you know, when you run over budget, when you, something takes too long, and, and it really comes down to the fact that we share the blame for bad code because we contribute to the problem. We're either not budgeting enough time, not being realistic with our estimates. Uh, we don't have enough resources because we went under or uh, our estimates, or because the stakeholders, the users, the managers are looking at us uh, to to give them accurate numbers. And if if we aren't accurate with our numbers, then you know it's it's not necessarily it's not just the project manager's fault. And I know a lot of developers are quick to to blame the project managers, but if the project managers and the stakeholders are or doing everything that us as developers are telling them to do, you know, we share a lot of that blame. And I don't know that professional developers or a lot of developers that I that I see that would call themselves a professional developer really take that kind of ownership of of when they do go over on their estimates. I, I think a lot of times that's missed simply because uh, the developer wasn't professional enough to push back and say, you know what, I need more requirements to do that. Absolutely. You know, it's hard. To, it's hard to make an estimate if you don't know what the hell you're doing, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've I've had many projects at a day job where it, you know, as a developer, I pushed back and said, "Look, I need 
I need more. I need more specs. I need more requirements. I need. I need to know this thing. You know, I have this. Uh, I have this. Uh, this cylinder, and I need to know where it's going. And you know, the the customer comes back and says it's a round hole. Two months later, it's a square hole or it's a star. Yeah. yeah it, and we've built projects like that. And that's just that's not professional as for you know for me as a developer that, or the project manager. You know, it's just a mess. And it, you know, unfortunately, in in, in the business world, when somebody's paying you. And they're somewhat okay with paying you to, to go through and, and have these bad experiences. You know, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna say no to the money? Are you gonna are you gonna upset a customer? I don't know. It, it's hard, but you know, it, it, you're you're right. It, it comes down to the developers being being able to push back enough and to to really kind of drive that home to a stakeholder and say, oh, well, if the, if 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 they're really serious, maybe I should listen. Well, and part of that, I mean, the developers have to be empowered with that kind of with that kind of agency, so they can say, "No, this is not a thing that's going to happen." And there are a lot of shops where that's just not. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of shops where that's just not the case. Where well, I, I I think there's a lot of developers who need to take the initiative to speak up and say, you know, I'm not going to let you push me. You know, there's a certain point where it's your job as a professional to say no. Right. Um, you know, and and that's part of being professional. You know, a doctor saying, "No, I'm going to wash my hands before I work on you because uh, first you're probably going to get sick, and then you're going to come back and sue me." So, uh, I mean, it, it's the same with us with developers, right? I mean, we we know that they're going to be unhappy with our product later if we aren't if we aren't dotting our eyes and crossing our t's. So, it's our job as a professional to say, "No, I'm sorry, I can't do that." Um, I mean, yeah, there's a time when we have to let the business win on occasion and let them defend their timelines and defend their features, but we overall have to be able to defend the code, and, and that's something else he says in this chapter. Yes, I yeah, love that I line. It's your job to defend the code. I love that. That was great. <laughs> yeah, and I, I especially liked that he, he clarified it and put it against. He said it's, you know, it's management or the stakeholders. It's, it's their job to defend the the timelines and the budgets and all that stuff, just as much as it is your job to defend the, uh, to defend you know, the code, the quality of what your product you're actually pushing out. And I think the only the only caution I have, you know, Adam, about, um, you know, being professional, you know, once you take the first step, like that first step, the first time you tell someone, no, I'm not going to do that. That's a bad idea. Or no, this is not something I can maintain. Or, you know, that that is something that I think becomes very addictive. Like once you, once you have been given that power and you know, exercised it and been like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a stand right here. Then you're like, what else can I say no to? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't like these slope. things. <laughs> it is, but, it is, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I always, I always, I always tell developers, it's like, it's great to say no, and it's our job to say no when it's appropriate, but. You can't just say no and expect them to follow you like a dog, right? Um, you have to come up with quantifiable reasons of here's why I said no and here's why you should listen to me and accept my professional opinion, um, you know, and and, come, and and show them really good reasons and validate exactly why you said no. I mean, just saying no and getting a win once in a while, yeah, that's going to happen, but it's going to be rare and you're going to find yourself very unhappy and you're going to make your boss your boss very unhappy because if you're saying no, you know, in the back of their mind, they're going to give you a couple wins, but after that, they're going to start pushing back and saying, "Hey, I need some reasons." Yeah. They're going to put you down in the combative line and then Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you end up looking for another you. job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. All right, so we've kind of got through things that we agree with. Does anybody have something that you disagreed with in this chapter? I almost disagreed at the very beginning. Um, I'm saying almost. Where he talks about uh, how there will always be code. Um, because I've, I've done some research on... Um, uh, modeling and, and automated modeling and code generation from modeling and it's pretty wild and crazy stuff and I I think in you know 30 years we're not going to be doing as much in, in PHP we're going to be up a level of abstraction but then he explained it and it was like that's still coding that you're 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 building the model to represent the system to tell the to the machine what to do um, and I was thinking about it and it's really it's like we, what we do in PHP back in you know, the 50s or whatever, everybody was in, 
assembly or machine code, and what we do now is such a higher level of, of abstraction from that, they wouldn't even recognize it. This, this, what we do is like our version of this, of this modeling, this model generated code. Um, so I almost disagreed with that, and then he clarified, and I no longer disagreed. Uh, yeah, I could I could see your 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 point there. I you know I think probably the first time I I read this, which was you know a year or two ago, somewhere or other, I don't know. But the first time I read it, I you know seeing that it didn't really click in my mind. You know what what he was talking about. Especially I was like, well, of course there's always going to be some sort of code. Until I started working in, uh, I started working a lot with DSLs in in Ruby especially. And I was like, I don't feel like I'm programming at this point. Yeah. I feel like all I'm doing is configuring. And you know, at that point, it, I was like, this is what he's talking about. It's you know, as we develop better and better tools and better languages that can specify uh, DSLs for what we want to accomplish, even even if it's not you know a DSL, even if it's you know something much more abstract that I can't even think of right now. But we're we're taking away the you know what I perceive as programming, but it is still, like, you still are taking the uh, the requirements and turning them into a specification that can be understood by the executor that's actually going to take what you've input and turn it into something that a machine can understand. And that's why I really harped on that whole, you know, your code, whether it's what we perceive as code right now or what people 50 years from now are going to perceive as code, is the details of the requirements. It is the specification of how whatever it is works. And I think that's that's definitely a, a good concept that I think is worth thinking about in depth. Like as, you know, first reaction is this guy's nuts. Like, what is he talking about? Of course it's going to be code. <laughs> but, but I think it is is worth the exercise of thinking about it in depth. Isn't that always the first reaction when Uncle Bob talks? He's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and then he explains what he means. <laughs> I, I think yeah, that's probably fair. I think my my favorite talk from him is Architecture: of The Lost Years, and I remember the first yeah. time I was reading it and, or watching the talk, I was like, "This guy is off his rocker. Like, what is he talking about? Why is he harping this?" And then I watched it again, and I've probably watched that talk you know ten or fifteen times. But you know, just I was like, "Oh, oh, I get it. I I saw this kind of I saw this problem." I saw the iceberg, the tip of this particular problem, and I get what he's saying. So there's definitely something to be said for having decades of experience in in a time when computers were advancing from whole floors of rooms to something you can carry in your pocket. Like there's definitely something to be said for the experience gained there. Yeah. Punch card to cell phone. <laughs> Can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Jarring, even maybe you don't disagree with it, but maybe it was something you were like surprised by. I don't know if I was necessarily surprised, but going back to the uh, the thought process of or the school of thought where he talks about martial artists, uh, even though all of the different martial artists may be practicing or maybe uh, following one kind, it, it's all. None of it is this higher final authority. It's all martial arts, right? And just like uh, schools of thought with with clean code, and you know, even if you look at it from a standpoint of what your code looks like, you know, y you may have clean code. You may be following uh, a PSR standard, and it, it, it's just a matter of you know, you may not be doing it the same way somebody else is, but that's okay. And and that was that was kind of nice to to see because I think in and you know, in our industry, it's a lot of you're either right or you're wrong. And if you don't do it how I do it, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily the case because neither that person or my, you know, their code or my code, neither one of them is really the final authority. It's either clean code or it's not. And, and I think the uh, a lot of what this book is, you know, covers is kind of like how to make that distinction and and really what is you know what is this particular school of thought versus this is the final authority on clean code. I think that, yeah, I think that's a, a, a definitely good point. I think that's the first thing I wrote down, you know, when he opened the opened the chapter, he was talking about essentially what is, the de like, what is good code? What is bad code? And, you know, at first I was ready to disagree with him immediately by saying, there is such thing as good code. There is such thing as bad code. 
Well, I mean, it's subjective a lot of times. Like, <clears throat> what I find good is not necessarily with you, but I think beyond that, beyond like that initial reaction, I think the what he was talking about was you know the idea of the transformation from you know bad to good or from you know primitive to elegant or whatever you want to call it but that that evolution of of code i think is what what we're after so there is a there's i'll say it like this i feel like there's a definition of good enough like i think there there's a definition of clean enough like i i think that this idea that there is a a reference somewhere that says all of your code must meet these 15 standards in order to be clean. I think chasing that even at, as an organization I think is problematic because even with coding standards and even even with those types of things there are certainly times when it makes more sense to violate the coding standard to make the code more readable than it does to enforce it just blindly. But that's something that is learned over time. I don't think that's something that I would encourage everyone to say, well, if it if it seems more readable to you, then go ahead and violate your coding standard. I think that's something that you'll develop. That's that code sense thing that he was talking about. Well, and I think yeah. that goes back to what Chris was saying about developers being artists. There's not... There is no gold standard for this is what clean code looks like. A lot, of, So much of it is subjective. It comes down to what works for me and what works for my organization. Um, so yeah, I I liked that he was like, we're really opinionated, but don't don't take that as gospel. It's just our strong opinion. Definitely true. And he did he did also say explicitly that uh, that writing clean code is like painting a picture. He's saying you know you can walk into a museum or something and you can recognize. Well, I guess if you walk in a museum, you're probably seeing good art. But you know, you can walk somewhere. And see <laughs> Not it. necessarily. Well, that's true. But you can see art, and I I always compare this to you know design, like designing of, of even websites and and that sort of thing. Like, I can tell when it's done right, and I can tell when it's done wrong. I can't do it. Like, I absolutely cannot design a web page to save my life. Like, there's, it, it's terrible. Like, I'm just I'm not good at it. So it, it's one of the, it, it is, you know, clean code, you can recognize when something is, you know, good, but you may not exactly know right now how to get there. Yeah, that, that's really us, the way I like, uh, I like to look at it as uh, we, we are artists. Uh, you also use the, the word craftsmanship a lot, and I think that, that makes, that, yeah, that, that's really how, how I would like to see it, and I would like everybody to see it. Um, you should be proud to uh, to write your name at the top of every file you, at every class you write. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with the the craftsman point because you're building something that works. Um, I kind of wonder about the art point because to me it's not so much about you're expressing the requirements, sure, but you aren't necessarily like expressing your you know your soul or anything like that. You're 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 building something probably for someone, so that's why. I just sometimes the whole like art poetry thing feels like it's a little bit too I don't know like new age and not enough of like this is grounded in um, we're building something for someone. Does anyone else have that reaction? I write my soul in my code. I don't okay. know what your problem is. Like, <laughs> <I'm really laughs> I think I think from my end it's not so much I'm pouring my heart and soul into my code, but that like a good artist, I want the product that I'm making to be the best possible thing that it can be. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, you know, worried that my blood, sweat, and tears is going to go into this code, but I, I want this to be something that other people can look at and enjoy, either because they are the ones that have to maintain it or because I'm having other people collaborate on the project or whatever. I think from that aspect, that's the way I look at it from a from a an artist standpoint. A, a craftsman is probably a better term for what we do because we are building stuff much like you know a carpenter is building a table. You can tell the difference between the you know the solder table that you buy and something that's made by someone who's been a carpenter for twenty years. 
you know, there's there's a difference even though they, they serve the same purpose. I think uh, a lot of times one of the reasons that uh, one of the reasons that folks attribute it with being artist uh, or artistry is is generally because there's emotion involved. Um, I mean, I'm not emotional about my code while I'm writing it, but after I see it, I'm definitely emotional about my code because it's mine. I created it. It's uh, it's something that I poured some time into, and and if it's done well, it is emotional. You know, because you you look at it and it's something that you care about. It's it's uh. You know, if to me, I mean, I care about the code that I write, and 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 therefore there is emotion. So I can see the artist aspect from that point of view. If that makes sense. I think, yeah, I, and it probably speaks to a lot of the fact that I, I'm usually dealing with legacy code, uh, but a lot of times uh, when when I'm talking about the code or the changes that I'm wanting to implement in our application, I get very passionate about the changes because I know why, and sometimes I struggle to fully articulate, you know, exactly why they're needed, and I just get stuck in this, you know, but it's because this is how we're supposed to do it, and, you know, people are fighting back on it because it's different, and it's it's just this, no, you just have to trust me. Let me let me spend two hours and, and, and flesh this out and then show you, and it'll be so much better. And, you know, sometimes you do have to kind of put that passion into it and some of some of it is you know trying to make sure that the the passion is coming through in the code to kind of show that in this legacy code base that has been neglected that there is somebody who has cared and you know wasn't just trying to get something out the door but trying to leave the code better than they found it I think that's fair and and I guess one thing I have to add is you know I do feel like I'm an artist and one day hope to see my my work printed out and put onto a mural somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Well, when uh, I did RPG, we printed our code all the freaking time. Yeah, yeah but I, I had professors in college that all of our work had to be printed, so we had these huge print queues, like tens of thousands of, of, of pages we could print in a semester because they, we had to print out uh, these programs that, I mean, they were... You know, 60, 70, 100, sometimes 500 pages of code. I'm just like, are you really going to read this in this format? And the answer is always no. They're literally just going to run the program. But I don't know. We had to print it out. So I probably have them in a box somewhere. It's just, here's my project. It's source control. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually have the first program I wrote uh, in Delphi when I was 12 printed out in a folder uh, somewhere. Nice. Yeah. With a, a dis diskette uh, with the program, <laughs> I don't have to have something something to read it anymore. But uh, I have it. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. That's that's an art. That's an heirloom that you can pass down someday and be like, M maybe I should frame it. Yeah, frame it. <laughs> <something wrong. laughs> Put it in a shadow box with a three and a half inch floppy drive. Yeah. <laughs> frame it with a good corkboard behind it for darts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, we'll wrap this up now. Um, I'd like to go around each of you just you know one thing that you are going to take and apply from this chapter. Hopefully you have something. Don't want to put you on the spot with this, but just something you took out of here that you are going to try to incorporate into your daily work. And we'll start with you, Adam. So, so it's something that I strive with on a, on a regular basis, uh, you know, in, in side jobs as well as my day to day. Um, I, you know, I consult a lot. So as I'm consulting, I'm I'm dealing with a lot of people who have some pretty bad code, uh, because that's my day job. It is is uh, you know I'm helping folks refactor and modernize and things like that. So I think something for me to that I constantly struggle with is is being able to push back a little bit on on businesses because uh, you know of course I want to make sure we maintain you know I keep the contract but at the same time you know I, I struggle with that so that's that's something that I get from this and and that's you know uh, that's a good a strong part of this chapter for me is pushing back and living up to being professional because they hired me to be a professional excellent uh, Chris um, I think one thing I'm going to try to do more is uh, make my code more matter-of-fact and less speculative. 
um, especially when I'm trying to integrate many different systems. You know, that goes into, you know, how I'm structuring my code and all that stuff, but I think that's probably one of the, the biggest things I'm going to take away from this chapter. Well, that that will be fun. And and you should not try to do it. You should actually do it, I think. <laughs> yeah, <sure>. My opinion. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jebba, what do you have? Um, I'm going to try <laughs> to write code that makes... That makes it look like the problem was was meant for that language. Okay. I I liked that concept a lot. I certainly okay. wish you well in that endeavor. That thank you very that's much. That's probably a, a challenge. But go for go for idiomatic PHP. <laughs> <laughs> Ray underscore filter. Best of mm. luck. All right, <laughs> Joe. So I I think uh, in, in like I've said a couple times, you know, a lot of what I do is legacy code, but I think one of the things I want to try to do more is, you know, not put stuff off until later and, you know, if I have to make sure I add a to do item that way my my IDE will kind of bug me and say, "Hey, you put this in there and and we can kind of taking that further and build to-do lists and and build task lists and and open tickets uh in some kind of support system that is like, hey, these things need to be done, and, and, and that way it's not always, I'll fix this code later. That's a very noble quest, I think. Yes. <laughs> it, it's probably going to fail miserably, but, yeah, it sounds good. Don't say that, man. It's <laughs> awesome. Have, have, some, have some faith, man. Right. Martin, what are you going to apply? Uh, I, I th think I'll work on the, the, the defend the code. Uh, like the managers defend the schedule. Um, fight for your rights. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good way to put it. I, I like that. I may, I may borrow that. Um, Nathaniel. Uh, kind of going off of uh, Gemma's point, making the language feel like it was designed for the problem and um, kind of a way to do it, I forget who said it, but someone said like every function you write or every subroutine is kind of like you're defining your own custom DSL for that problem. So I think my thing is just to write a bunch of small little functions that say like is active or like has this thing and just like keep doing that and that way the actual work and the thing that's composing it is just looks like a bunch of those function calls. I could say from personal experience from refactoring things to that sort of style, that's going to pay huge dividends going forward to when, you know, it's six months from now and you're looking at the same project or someone else is looking at it and they're going to be like, what is this doing? Going through and reading something that kind of seems like mm -hmm. it is just spoken language written down is so much easier to figure out where problems are than, oh, this is calling something that doesn't make any sense. This is even the same name. I don't understand. Like, it's so much easier to be able to go through in that way. So that is definitely a good one. Um, as for myself, um, I think what I'm going to work on is every commit I make, or I'm going to commit to, every commit that I make, I'm going to fix one small problem. So I'm going to take that Boy Scout rule and, and just actually apply it and say, every single time I commit anything, no matter what it is, I'm going to fix one additional thing. So maybe it's a variable name. I'll make it easy on myself, or maybe it's cleaning something up seriously. So... We're going to stock your GitHub feed now. Oh, well, that's fine. <laughs> and we're going to watch. <laughs> okay, my work projects are private, so... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so thank you all very much for, for participating tonight. I think it was a great conversation. Um, we're going to be covering Chapter 2 in two weeks. Um, so read up, and two weeks from today, we will be in another discussion.